you see the top of your head. Okay, let me. Might want to move it down. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that's good. That was good. Thank you. All right. Do you have your recording going? Yes. Can we get on the screen so we can see it too? Okay, Mayor. Okay, okay, we'll call the September 9th, 2020 City Council Workshop to order. Uh, Ms. Sykes, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Green? Here. Mr. Hill? Here. Mr. Jefferson? Here. Mr. Moses? Here. Ms. Mayor Witt? Here. Mr. Coverline? Here. Mr. Huffenberger? Here. And Chief Gilmore? Oh. All right, item three is discussion of affordable housing uh, PowerPoint presentation, Mr. Elfenberger. Okay, uh, tonight I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, affordable housing uh, with a PowerPoint and then a suggested uh, resolution for the council to consider for a future council meeting. Uh, what is affordable housing generally? Uh, there's a couple of parameters to this. The first one is the income uh, eligibility. Uh, in order to be income eligible, you must be in one of four categories. Uh, the first one is extremely low income, defined as below 30% of the area median income. The second is very low income, uh, below 50% of the area median income. The third one is low income, which is a family at or below 80% of the area median income. And the fourth is moderate income, where the family is at or below 120% of area median income. Uh, and if you want to go in great detail on the incomes, there is a federal site, the US Housing and Urban Development that I have in this next uh, slide. Uh, also, if the slide is available, uh, uh, it'd be great to have it on the, uh, the screen. Um, I noticed that uh, it was up earlier and it would be great to have it back. So uh, the uh, other item would be uh, the Florida Housing Coalition, which is a state site. Uh, you click on ship and then income limits and that will give you all the information on that portion of the eligibility. So uh, in addition to being an eligible household, uh, the uh, family would limit would have to, the spending for that family would have to be no more than 30% of your of the income on rent or mortgage payments. And what makes the uh, housing affordable is a decrease in the monthly rent or mortgage payments so that the income eligible family is able to pay less for the housing than it would otherwise cost at a market rate. Uh, and typically a couple of uh, popular programs for affordable housing uh, are government programs through the uh, low income housing tax credit program through the Florida Housing Finance Corporation and the State Housing Initiatives Partnership, more commonly known as the SHIP program. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have the uh, PowerPoint available yet, but uh, that would be very nice if we would have it. Uh, the, let's see. The next thing would be, uh, okay, there we go. Um, okay, so that if you skip to the next slide, just click to the next slide, the next one after that. 
Okay, the, ne the next one after that. Okay, so uh, how is affordable housing developed? Uh, a lot of times it starts with the comprehensive planning uh, or the comprehensive plan for community and what's recommended is that there'd be uh, designated affordable housing sites on a, fu a future land use map within the community with an emphasis that it be within the urban service boundary for utilities. It'd be close to major employment. Transportation would be close by as well as schools, daycares and other social services. Next slide. Um, so, uh, the, uh, okay, the next slide, please. Okay, the change in comprehensive planning or zoning. Uh, some of the suggestions would be that you would permit affordable housing in any residential area or in certain residential areas. Uh, designating adequate sites for multifamily housing within the community, uh, allowing accessory dwelling units in some single family zones so you can provide for affordable uh, housing. Let's say you have a, what's commonly known as mother-in-law suite when the mother-in-law is no longer using that, it could be for affordable housing. Uh, there would also be changes in development codes, permitting things like pocket neighborhoods. Currently, there is an effort to look at potentially having tiny homes uh, where you'd have, like near the Veterans Administration, uh, there's an effort being looked at for, for a tiny home development where you would have homes much smaller than normal, but it would be a place for uh, displaced or homeless veterans to, to go to. Uh, the suggestion would be that it would be uh, so many per, per acre and uh, currently there's an effort looking to try to get about 25 homes in a future development, but it's in the very infancy stages of uh, research right now. Uh, other, next slide. No, before you move any further, I got a question. Sure. Uh, I have a, a, just a couple that just moved up here from down south. Yes. Uh, they bought a piece of property right around the corner from where I live at. Okay. And um, they invited me over to uh, to look at the. Uh, it, it has it has a house on it, and behind this house, it has another little small house, which they are uh, is termite infested, and just like you said about the mother-in-law, the wife mother has cancer, and they want to redo that. Uh, I guess they want to tear it down and start over. But would that be a problem? Uh, with doing that, um, would that fall? Would that be something that falls up under this program here? Uh, that would. We'd have to look at the code to see whether, for that zoning category, you'd have to allow it or just allow it under certain uh, guidelines within residential zoning codes. You probably wouldn't want it in every zone, but in certain zones like that area, it may be very uh, suitable for a mother-in-law type home or that could be used for affordable housing. So uh, we need to, uh, I can work with you on that. Uh, I will uh, talk to you after the meeting and, and see about uh, how we proceed on that, that particular uh, uh, situation. All right, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, so the next one is uh, adopt the, uh, the land development regulations. Typically what you see in a lot of communities is that for affordable housing considerations, the impact fee would either be waived or reduced and the city has already done some of that, uh, requiring certain developments to include a percentage of affordable housing. For example, if you have a very large residential development 
over a certain size, you may say that a small percentage of that uh, should be required or encouraged to be affordable housing. So uh, that's something that the planning uh, or growth management department would need to take a look at to make further recommendations to the city council. Next slide. Okay, so good comprehensive planning would include a housing element with measurable goals, objectives, and policies that relate to affordable housing. So when we're looking at either coming up with an amendment to the comprehensive plan or when we consider a major upgrade to the comprehensive plan, we ought to include uh, this housing element to uh, address affordable housing in more detail. Next slide. Then there's the adoption of the uh, zoning code. I in some areas you see uh, density bonus for special exceptions uh, rather than as a conditional use. Uh, that would need a zoning change possibly. Uh, you can also do that through an economic development agreement uh, for a specific development, but if you want to more broadly impact the community, we would need to look at uh, our zoning codes and how we'd allow the density bonus for uh, developments that include affordable housing. Uh, we're also looking at uh, in certain residential zones, maybe allowing all types of residential uses within those specific zones. And there's also procedures that maybe they're not, they're routine things, they're not creating new policy. Uh, if some of those could be delegated to the staff rather than being, requiring them to go before the planning and zoning uh, commission or before the city council, that may knock off two or three months in the process of trying to come up with affordable housing. So those things need to be taken a look at and we're already in the process of looking at that for, for business uses. The suggestion is that maybe we should look at that for affordable housing also. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the regulatory reform, uh, there's some caution in this. You don't just uh, cut the cost of housing. The quality of that housing needs to be maintained when you're trying to reduce the costs. Uh, you've got to look at things that do not affect the quality when you're trying to make the house more affordable. Uh, things like minimum square footage requirements or requiring a certain amount of garage space within a home you may not want to have that broadly required within the zoning code. It may be fine within a, re, a certain small residential development through restrictive covenants that are not uh, enforced by the city. But as far as a broad paintbrush, we're looking at minimizing the requirements that drive up the cost of housing for our residents. Uh, also, there may be uh, a provision where <coughs> if you have an affordable housing application that it gets uh, expedited permit uh, consideration, it may get a uh, higher priority than, than the average permit. Uh, I don't see that as a, a, a big problem right now if you had a, a lot of residential building, that might be a consideration for the future. Uh, another idea is to do a housing economic impact assessment. Every time the government or the city would adopt an ordinance, uh, if it has any relation to housing to determine its impact on the housing market. I would think that for comprehensive type uh, ordinances or resolution changes that would be 
very helpful. Uh, next slide. The affordable housing process starts with the staff inventorying the city owned properties uh, for potential affordable housing sites. And what they need to do is make sure that there, you may have numerous sites, but a lot of them that are vacant may have major utility lines running through them. They might be part of a future utility expansion. Uh, they may have other purposes that the city needs for let's say uh, running a through street to connect up in the future as you have uh, growth. So the staff needs to uh, evaluate all these lots and make sure that we're, we're not shooting ourselves in the foot as we're trying to uh, come up with lots that make a lot of sense to be uh, used for affordable housing. Uh, a while back, we talked about the five options for city owned parcels and please go to the next slide. Uh, and they are again, the, uh, you can offer the property for sale with the proceeds used for the purchase of affordable housing land. Uh, second is you can offer property for sale where the proceeds in, uh, are used for nonprofit affordable housing funds. A third is to offer the property for sale with a restriction that it be for affordable housing development only. A fourth is to donate the nonprofit affordable housing to a nonprofit affordable housing group. Uh, funds from the from the city. Uh, the fifth is to designate certain properties to allow for future affordable housing development. For example, if you want to create a mixed use housing development of affordable housing or let's say a multifamily, you may have to combine a number of single family lots in order to have a piece of land large enough to do the larger project. Next slide. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this one and go to the next slide because I want to cover the uh, resolution first. The uh, public is, uh, okay, the, pl the bid process for affordable housing starts with uh, once the staff has identified what properties are suitable uh, and the council has had a chance to review them and approve excess property, then the public is invited to bid. Uh, the bids are submitted, reviewed by staff and the city council decides uh, on the winning bids uh, for the properties the successful bidders would have one year to obtain a building permit and the affordable housing would be need to, needed to be built within one year of the building permit being taken out. Now, um, I also, if there's questions on this, uh, I also have a a sample or suggested resolution that I think would narrow down some of these options. First of all, are there questions on anything that's been uh, brought up so far? I have a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll wait till we talk about the resolution. Sure. Okay, so the next thing would be, uh, in the next slide, please. Uh, I don't think the resolution may be on this PowerPoint, but uh, essentially, uh, I believe it's in your packets. Uh, Florida statute 166.0451 regulates the disposition of municipal property for affordable housing. And that gives the city council the authority to uh, establish a policy for, for the disposition of affordable housing. Um, what I'm proposing is a policy for city owned property for affordable housing that we would have a th every three years, the city council would 
uh, have the staff prepare an inventory list uh, within its jurisdiction for land that the city uh, owns that is appropriate for affordable housing. And it would specify whether it's vacant or improved property. Uh, then the governing body would be required under the statutes to review the inventory list at a public hearing. Uh, they could revise it or uh, approve the list as presented. And they would then adopt a resolution including uh, what they would consider the inventory list for the uh, property that they would consider for affordable housing. There would be three options I would recommend. The first would be that the city uh, would offer the property for donation to any nonprofit uh, housing organization for affordable housing. The permit would need to be uh, obtained within 12 months of the donation date of the property with construction completed within 18 months of the donation date or the property would revert back to the city. And this time frame would not be allowed to be modified or extended. The second option is the city would offer the property to the highest bidder by means of a closed bid sale with the restriction that the property would be developed for permanent affordable housing. The third option would be that the city would offer the property for sale to the highest bidder by a closed bid and then the profits from the sale of the property would be used by the city to fund nonprofit affordable housing projects. And that the city would then use one of those uh, options to dispose of excess property suitable for affordable housing. The rest of the uh, ordinance deals with uh, just uh, items such as if any part of it is found to be invalid or unconstitutional, the rest of it is would be valid. And this would be kept with the growth management department and available for the public. Okay, so that's basically what I have for a resolution suggestion at this time. Um, Mr. Helfenberger, I got uh, several questions. Is this a good time? Certainly, certainly. Um, the, for two and three, is there no time limit? Uh, for options two and three. Option one had the 18 months, right. but two and three, there's no time limit? Uh, we could put that same time limit in. It's not in the uh, in the resolution, but that that language could certainly be added for two. I, I mean, I think that's important. If we, you know, that they, that there's a, a time limit put on that developing that property, and for on number two, what is permanent affordable housing? What's the word permanent mean there? Generally, there would be a, a period of time specified that the property would have to be uh, having uh, it used as affordable housing. Uh, you could set, uh, let's say, a 10 year limit or a, a limit that. Uh, the council feels would be sufficient to uh, satisfy the purpose for for this. You may not want to put forever, but permanent would be longer term, longer than a few years. Okay, do we need to designate a, a time instead of just saying permanent? We could do that. Uh, I would propose 10 years. Okay. Okay, and um, so what in, in determining, we put this out for bid and um, people bid on it. Our staff recommends uh, Sam gets it. Um, 
has the lowest bid and they recommend that that's who we sell it to. The highest um, bid, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the highest bid. Um, so what, to determine if it's affordable, if determine they are putting in true affordable housing, what do we use as, do we use that, what is affordable housing um, screenshot that you had extremely low income there are four different categories is, right. do they have to do they have to meet any certain of those categories i believe it has to meet one of those four categories and it has to be 30 percent or less of their income should that be in the resolution as well that would be that would be helpful it would be specific and we could put those guidelines in there as what uh, we can't, what would constitute affordable housing. Uh -huh. We could put a definition section in. I just think the more that we can narrow this down, the less chance we'll have that, that it would be misconstrued. And Okay. Um, okay. Makes sense. Okay, I mean, household. Okay. And also, I, I'm sorry. Also, um, if we're going to do things from the city for whomever gets the bid, such as impact fees reduced or um, other things that we can do in house, should that be spelled out? I know there was a, um, a slide about those things, but do we need to be specific what actually we will um, be a, be offering those people that that do receive that property. That would make it easier, and that would make it a lot more of an administrative function instead of having this go before the council for each and every decision. And do we? Okay. And one other question. I'm so sorry, but so when we sell this property, do does the city council? Um, make the decision one, two, and three, or who makes that decision? What option is chosen? Do we do it before we we place it for bid, or decide to sell it to a nonprofit? Okay, you would need to uh, decide the option beforehand mm -hmm. uh, because that would affect uh, that would probably affects how who would want to bid on some of the some of the options so they would come to us the staff would come to us yes. with five properties or two properties or whatever and then we decide the option and then then the next step is it's put out for bid or it's donated to a nonprofit correct whichever option we choose okay and then getting back to your previous question i would recommend uh, reducing the impact fee by 50 percent okay that's what we did in a in a couple cases in the past that would be consistent with past practice okay um from what i understand the law changed and and the um the rules that we have to go by for zoning have changed for affordable housing. They can, we could put affordable housing anywhere, right? Correct. So we don't really need to, to put anything about the zoning of it in our resolution in that it's already designated by the state. Um, you could put it in the zoning uh, categories or it would have to come before the city council to make an individual decision. So the more you put into the ordinance or into the zoning category, the less it has to go before council for a decision. So, so what, what would we say? Um, you could say, you, what you probably want to say then is in specific residential zones it's allowed or in all residential zones it's allowed whatever 
the council would, what we could do is uh, take a look at the zones we have, come up with the staff recommendation, and then the council could either accept or reject it or modify it. Okay. And I could do that along with uh, bringing the resolution back to the council. So what I think helps is that then it streamlines it more so you don't have this coming to you by case by case basis. Right. You set the broad guideline and then we follow it for the majority of cases and you just have this, the exceptions that don't fit any of the guidelines. Mm -hmm. so, it, it, it keeps a lot of the smaller ones from coming up to the council. Okay. Well, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to <coughs> build affordable housing, of course. That's our, our main goal. But we want to make it as streamlined so it's fair to everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. And by putting all this information into the resolution and streamlining it, you're speeding up the process for people that would like to create, create affordable housing. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Heffelberger, is there a state uh, regulation or a federal regulation that defines uh, affordable housing that we would have to go by that we would need to refer to? I, well, what I'd like to do is just put a definition in, in the resolution that it would consist of two things. It would consist of the, uh, the one, they'd have to be in one of those four categories uh, for, the, for the specific neighborhood and they would have to be at 30% or less of their income spent uh, on rent or mortgage payments but it goes by neighborhood. Uh, and uh, Mr. Koberlein might be able to elaborate on that, but I think you're looking at the, uh, one of the four income, <laughs> income levels, 30% uh, or less spent on, on, on housing for the neighborhood uh, that they live in. It goes, um, So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mr. Korbelein, is there any other points uh, that we have to cover as far as the definition of affordable um, household? So um, I think if we put the definition, it, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I was addressing you, Mayor, and I didn't have my uh, button unmuted. Okay. The goal, I, my impression here all along for the past year is that the goal here is to get this property back into the citizens' hands, uh, especially those who qualify for affordable housing. The, with that goal in mind, the state statute has defined the term affordable for quite some time. To get our, we don't want to run afoul of making our definition any more strict than the state statute. For example, if we include a definition of affordable in, the, in a resolution, if the statute broadens the definition next year, here we are being more strict. So if we just track the language of the statute and allow our definition to change with the statute, we can always try to achieve the goal and not have to revisit a definition. What I heard earlier when Ms. Moses was being addressed is that we want clarity and to let people know, but at the same time, we don't want to handcuff ourselves should the definition change and become even more relaxed next legislative session or the session after. 
So I would pause and suggest we don't put it in the resolution, yet we track the state statute. We might be able to craft some language that says, here's the current statute and we will change over time as the statute changes and if it becomes more relaxed. Um, and we just saw a um, large relaxation of the state laws that Ms. Moses, I believe, was inferring is that um, House Bill 1339 was passed and it allows for residential affordable, house, affordable housing to be developed at your discretion, the city council's discretion in um, residential, commercial, and industrial. And that's quite a big change. We do need to, Mr. Young and I with growth, growth management have been conferencing in that we do need to get the, um, the land development regulations up to date so that they can mention that to developers who are looking to come into the community and develop affordable housing. So I would, to go back to your question, Mayor, we, I suggest we track the state statute and we craft some language that tr continues to track the state statute for years to come. That's what I was getting at, yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Any other questions? Um, Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Uh, so what Mr. Cooperline said makes complete sense to me, and, and, and I would definitely uh, would want us to uh, have language that uh, marries the state statute and, and changes uh, over time with the state. Um, I think that's uh, prudent to do. Um, my concern, uh, Mr. Helenberger, <laughs> is, uh, and, and I know it, this has come up a few times, we, the city wants to have all the options available uh, uh, that we can because certain circumstances are different. Um, uh, I have concerns with the first option as far as uh, donating, uh, just donating the property um, as opposed to uh, options two and three. Um, uh, I think that uh, it's important for whoever uh, uh, receives the property uh, to have some skin in the game, uh, so to speak. So uh, the, just donating uh, the property is something that I, I'm not in favor of. Uh, uh, I am in favor of options two and three that's in that sample resolution that you had uh, uh, referenced. Um, but uh, that's, that's just me personally. So I don't, I don't know how the other council members feel, but I wanted to put that out there. I totally agree with you, Mr. Green. And I, when I read them, I, you know, my, my feeling was, of course, that, that I think two and three is where we're going to go. But one, you know, I just couldn't think of an, of an option where we would want to do number one, um, option number one, but is there, is there anything that you could say, Mr. Helfenberger, that any type of situation where we would, we would want to donate property to nonprofit? I mean. Well, you have uh, some of the property that uh... The, our, our current local nonprofit has had for, for uh, housing. Uh, they did get land donated by the county for, for some of their uh, activities. Uh, what we could do is we could list all the five options that the, uh, that are allowed by statute and then uh, what we could do is highlight that the preferred options are option two and three, but there is no restriction on the city council uh, for using any of the five options. So we can, instead of having option one in there, we'd have list the five <laughs> options. And then uh, I could highlight option two and three as the, uh, in the, majority of cases being the preferred option. I, I like that recommendation because I, mm -hmm. I agree with Mr. Green on they should have something in it, but there mm -hmm. may be that situation where we want to do it and we could have it still there, but show the others as our preferences. I right. agree. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mayor. It one of the issues that brought this affordable, one of the issues that the administration uh, ran into a couple of years ago 
that has brought us to this workshop in large part because a statute that requires this has been on the books for uh, at least a decade. The issue came up with the donation and there was a deed restriction. The deed restriction said to build housing, affordable housing within a certain number of years and it did not get done. And then the affordable housing development was available, but the not-for-profit had to come back to the city because they no longer had clean title. And they asked the city for a new deed. And I brought up to Mr. Kaysen, well, that would be in contradiction of uh, chapter 166. We should be doing this every three years. So that was an issue where property was donated in past practices. And there were several instances of that to a not-for-profit for development. And the developer simply didn't get it done, whether that's, it's probably no fault of the developer. It probably had something to do with the market conditions. An example of where it would be used is that in the category, one of four categories is extremely low income persons. It's going to be very hard to find a developer that can develop a profit property, especially with the cost of lumber as we see them right now but develop a property and still keep it in the extremely low income person's category. So I wanted to let you know that we have had those, those past practices. I, um, I like to see us change our past practices where we have a resolution and we're not doing it ad hoc. And that is what we are doing now. We're working on that practice but that is a past practice of a not-for-profit. Not and um, that's an example of how a not-for-profit could come into play to get houses built for extremely low-income persons when a private developer may, not, may just not be able to get it done or at that pricing level. Mr. Caberline, uh, you know, we're talking about if they don't do something within a certain period of time, the property reverts back to the city. My understanding would be if we deeded it, we'd have to still do a action to get the property back. I don't think, I don't know if there's an actual way to do it without that. Do you? We, we can do an automatic reverter. And if we have that, which is what was in the uh, example that I just gave, there was an automatic reverter. And so when anyone tried to convey that property in the future, the title search came up and said, whoa, that automatically went back to the city. And so if we're still holding possession, we likely will not have to do anything on title, for example, a quiet title action or anything, because we conveyed the property, it automatically reverted back, and here we are wanting to do something again. The title has it, there's not much clouding there with that automatic reverter. Okay, I got you. Anybody else have anything else? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I had another question sure. uh, for Mr. Helfenberg. I know the um, previous list of properties uh, that we had seen, um, there were issues with some of those properties uh, not meeting um, uh, the requirements as far as maybe they were too small or too close. Uh, and I didn't see anything in the sample resolution that addresses that. If uh, there's an outlier where a property maybe is an excess property for the city, but, it, but doesn't meet the requirements uh, to be able to be uh, buildable. Um, Mr. Helfberg, could you talk about that just a little bit? Okay, what I've done in, in uh, my career as far as some of those outliers is if they have a neg negligible value, uh, we've... Uh, uh, offered them to uh, adjoining landowners or another process might be to uh, put them out for bid if an adjoining landowner would bid on it. Uh, but if the outlier property has no uh, past, present, or future use for the city, uh, I don't see why we would hang on to those, especially if they're not buildable. So if, if a property did not meet 
um, all of the requirements to become uh, buildable, then it would not be on the list or should not be on the list uh, as an option for the affordable housing program, correct? Correct. Well, Mr. Yeah. King, if a piece of property may not be suitable for building affordable housing, but I guess we could still sell it and put that money in, uh, I guess, option three, where we would give the money then to affordable housing. I, th I think that I think you're exactly right, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, and I would love to see us do that uh, when, when we have the, and I know that we have some properties that maybe don't meet the uh, ability to be buildable. So um, yeah. I think I think that's exactly what we do with those properties. I, I agree completely. Anybody else have anything? Mayor? Yes. I, I wanted to address the issue of impact fees. It's uh, been a long time. <laughs> We've uh, dealt with that for a number of years now, and um, past practices have not always been conducive with the law. And to, tonight, I've heard that we could ch we could change those, and that it would be in the resolution. The Florida Impact Fee Act requires us to do impact fees by ordinance, and we have to do a study of it. Uh, Mr. Elfenberger and I have discussed that for some time that we do need a study. The Additionally, to enact an ordinance or a change on impact fees, you have to give an extended amount of uh, public notice, meaning up to 90 days or more. We, our current code says that we can defer payments of impact fees and connection fees for applicants who meet criteria for low and moderate income households. And so for years, there's been this mm -hmm. offer to defer payments but not completely waive them. We might be able to completely waive them or get them to an extremely low amount, but we're going to have to do it by ordinance. To touch our issue of impact fees, we must first do a new study, and two, we must do it by ordinance. And I'm telling you that those two things by law are going to take some time, so we can work on a resolution and get affordable housing out to the market. But when it comes to impact fees for the developer, our code has always said that they shall be paid. And it considers low and in, low income and um, moderate income households, it considers relief for them, but it only offers a deferral, not a waiver. And um, we have had that issue for a number of years. And um, Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to tackle it and take it on very soon. But I want you to know that the impact fees cannot be modified by resolution. They may be able to be modified, but it's going to be somewhat of a, a, a long, not a long journey, but a, a much longer journey than a resolution. Maybe what we could do is in the resolution refer to the uh, impact fee ordinance and say that any uh, effects on the impact fees would refer to what's required by our ordinance. Oh, ab absolutely, but we have to get that ordinance revised and that's what I was trying to get to there, that it's going to be a, a rather lengthy process. Okay. Oh, Can I ask Mr. a question? Sure. Go ahead, Mr. Gray. I apologize, Ms. Moses. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Kerblon, what you just uh, referenced, uh, is that a, uh, that's a state statute that you referenced? Yes, sir. It's the uh, Florida Impact Fee Act. It's in Chapter 163. So my question is, um, then, if, if we can, uh, what we were talking about before, if we can just uh, have that language as uh, part of what, uh, of what we pass for affordable housing with the ability to change as the state changes, um, uh, would that be uh, possible so that we're going to marry the state language uh, as it relates to affordable housing and impact fees? Well, we, um, if you, just a moment, please. Um, sure. We can do, we will certainly track the language, but what I'm trying to express is that to e the statute says we can do a waiver or an exception for an impact fee for the development or construction of affordable housing. We have never taken advantage of that. Our code has, again, handcuffed us. We need to un 
we need to unlock those handcuffs. In order to unlock those handcuffs, we may be looking at a several month process. Because again, when we change the impact fee ordinance, it doesn't just require the 10 day public notice that we're used to. It requires at least 90 days. I see. Go ahead, Ms. Moses. <laughs> I, mean, I was hoping you were gonna ask the same question I was gonna ask, but um, you, did I hear you correctly when you said that we can't wait, but we can defer? Is What exactly would that entail? Just deferring the, the impact fee? How, what would we be doing by deferring it? It's not a whole lot of relief, Ms. Moses. It's like uh, what we hear about the payroll tax deferral right now. If you want to be, have your payroll taxes deferred right now, uh -huh. expect to pay expect to pay them in the spring, and so it's it's not a whole lot of help to anyone. It's uh, so it's basically telling a person, okay, you qualify for low income housing. That means that you're probably not going to be getting a bonus or any type of huge raise. You're in that socioeconomic class. So we're going to defer your several thousand dollar impact fee for about six months. Oh, okay. That's so, not helping anyone. Right. The homeowner would still have to pay it, so, but it would be after the house is built. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I got you. Okay. So that's, that's of no benefit. Okay. Right. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, if there's no other questions, I guess we can go to uh, comments by the public. Uh, Mandy, do we have anybody in the public that wishes to comment at this time? Mr. Bowden, did you wish to speak? Mr. Bowden, can you hear us? He's muted. I guess I'm muted. You hear me now? Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, no, I don't have any questions. I, I think I understand what the process is. Okay. okay. All right. If we don't have any uh, public comments, <coughs> uh, staff or council, if not, we'll be adjourned until six o'clock. Uh, should we just stay tuned in? Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Take a couple of minutes and uh, start back at six. Yeah, so they can be separated. <clears throat>